And I think we are live now. Better tell me we're live. Yes, we are. We are live now. This is Polygon issuance number 53 for Friday, April 3rd, 2015. Those that would know, April 3rd is a very famous tornado outbreak day and back in 1974. And currently looking at where that outbreak had taken place in 74, there's a lot of severe weather there right now. A couple of watches, a couple of warnings. Doesn't look to be that big of a deal, but if there's a tornado and it's coming down your street, it is a big deal then. But but our guest tonight, he's seen so many tornadoes, he's been in so many hurricanes that if we went through every single one, we'd be here until next Friday. So we're going to try and condense that down. But uh, Tim Marshall is with us. He He's famous. He's a famous storm chaser. He's a famous engineer. He's a famous meteorologist. I think he might be famous for other things, but I'm not sure. So, and he's joining us from his house in outside of Dallas, Texas. I think. I assume that's where you are. Yes. Yeah. So he's joining us pretty much almost like he's in the dark right now. So, but so we usually when we start asking questions of our guest, like how you got interested in weather. Well, I pretty much already know the answer, so I'm going to kind of deviate where there was a certain incident that occurred, because you grew up in the Chicago suburbs, in, I think it was Oak Lawn, Illinois, is that correct, where you were raised? Yes. Okay, and there, I had to remember, I didn't want to say Oak Park, because I'm like, that doesn't sound right. Oak Lawn, Illinois. Now, this is where your interest started, because there was a certain tornado that hit there in April of 1967 when you were still in elementary school. So talk about that for a little bit. Sure. I mean, I was just about 9 or 10 years old, and I went to school, and the weather turned bad, so they sent us home, and it just looked like an ordinary day, but it was a little warm and muggy for April. And the skies got dark, and tornado warnings happened, and the tornado hit just uh, about a mile and a half, two miles away, and there was a lot of sirens throughout the night. The power went out. Didn't hit my house, fortunately. There was some damage, just minor damage on the block, siding and antennas and things. But uh, went to school the next day, saw that uh, some kids were injured, didn't come back, and then my mom volunteered for the Red Cross, took me around, showed me the destruction, and I asked her, what, what is this thing that comes out of the sky and does this kind of dest destruction? She had no idea. She thought, well, you know, it had something to do with lightning and had no idea really what, what tornadoes were, where they came from, just knew that they happened. So I was curious about it and studied and read everything I could, and of course I was in Chicago, the Mecca, if you will, at that time, uh, Ted Fujita was down at the University of Chicago. Uh, there was a meteorology program, still is, at uh, Northern Illinois University. I wrote all the TV meteorologists, read everything I could, checked out all the books I could, and it was great. Got my interest in it. For Christmas, my parents got me a barometer. I mean, that's what I wanted. I got a barometer, so I started taking uh, daily weather records. Actually, I started taking daily weather records before the tornado. Because I was already interested in weather, and this event kind of focused my attention on tornadoes. So there I went, nine years old, I believe, and had no choice in my career. So I was going to study. Yeah, continue because I interrupted. No, that's why. Go ahead. I was going to study tornadoes the rest of my life. That was it. Okay, so that so you were interested in weather. And then this tornado happened, so it's like, well, I want to discuss or look into why this happened. So you were in school in in the seventies, and then after you went to Northern Illinois, you went to Texas Tech, I think. Yes, that's right, Texas Tech. Yes. Okay, which is in Lubbock, another famous town that had been hit by a tornado in nineteen seventy. So it's like. You go from one place, Northern Illinois is not like a mecca of tornadoes, but it's a lot of tornado research back in the day, and you go to Texas Tech, 
and I see and I saw a thing where it said the minute you went into Texas, you saw your first tornado like almost immediately. Yeah, you talk about irony. As I crossed over the border into Texas for the very first time in my life, turned south in Amarillo and it was kind of gungy, warm front, overrunning precip. Clear out of that, there's a supercell and it puts down a tornado right in front of me. And that was an omen. So amazing. So when I got the Texas Tech and I told the prof there, I said, Hey, you never believe this. I just I just came here and after a long, long drive from Chicago, and I just saw a tornado. And he goes, yeah, right, sure, okay. We got a real live one here. But uh, it was for real. It was in the newspaper the next day. He goes, my gosh, you were right. It was a tornado. Your first tornado on your first day in Texas. Now that's great. But, but is, isn't it... And that was, and you weren't even chasing, so that wasn't like a thing for you. You were just driving from one place to another, and here's a tornado. So, like you said, it's like an omen. Did you think at that point, besides studying tornadoes and whatnot, that you wanted to go and chase them? Well, that was the reason I went down to Texas Tech, is because they enticed me by saying, hey, if you come to our school, we, we have a tornado intercept program that we just formed and you would be part of that and you chase tornadoes and film them. They it was really important in those days to film tornadoes hitting buildings and doing a thing called ground tree. And so that was what they were really looking at right then is to take high quality, we had sixteen millimeter cameras, high quality film of the tornado and then do photogrammetry to determine wind speed. So that was really the big push there. So it was either that or go to the South Dakota School of Mines where I just was uh, over the weekend in Rapid City, South Dakota. And actually it was earlier this week I was in Rapid City. And I had to make a choice of really go there and study hail or go down to Texas Tech and study tornadoes. So it was kind of a no-brainer for me to study tornadoes. So it and that this was at that point in the late seventies, early eighties. When it was late seventies, yeah. Yeah, so it's like there isn't the crazy storm chasers yet. Most of the people that are out there are either spotters or researchers, like going out on these tornado intercepts. And I know at that time I think OU was doing something, especially by the early eighties at that point. So what kind? What was it like in the early days of storm chasing when you were still at Texas Tech going to school? Well, now we would say it's primitive. I mean, there's no cell phones, no internet. The radar was crude, say, you know, really. And we had a call from pay phones to the weather office. And those were the old uh, phone booths that we had to use and coin operated and call into the weather service and they would tell us what kind of blips they had and where they were located and whether they had any appendages that looked kind of hookish on. And that was about it. I mean, it really was primitive. Uh, no weather radio was going, but the range was only about 40 miles, so you get more than 40 miles or so from the, the town and, you know, you're in, you're in really nothing that you could really get any information. The radio occasionally, AM radio, They'd give a couple of hour-old radar reports, so that wouldn't really be much of a help. Uh, so it was really primitive. So in, in, in that time, was there any tornado events that you can remember that kind of really piqued your interest? Because I think I remember, and I saw something, where the first survey you ever did was not even in Texas. It was in Nebraska. Right. In which is, well, which well, is the night the, yeah. for those that don't know. The, the, well, the first official survey was in Nebraska, but or, uh, there was a tornado that hit Wellington, Texas, I believe, in 78. And we did a house-by-house -house survey there, but that has not been published. That's more of a, the graduate students went up there. Yeah, I was chasing with Eric Rasmussen at the time, and we surveyed, did a block-by-block -block survey of that. Certainly, the first formal survey went on 
was 1980, June 3rd. That was the Grand Island, Nebraska outbreak. And in that instance, the Civil Engineering Department called over to the ATMO Department where I was at and asked for volunteers to go up to Grand Island to survey damage. And they also indicated that Ted Fujita was going to be uh, in the area to survey as well. So I jumped at that chance to work with the engineers and see firsthand what the destruction is and try to figure something out about it. That was one of the big keys for me. Was I've seen destruction before, but I try to determine how buildings are constructed and how they fall apart. That was one of the interests that I had. Is, is that more or less when, when you went up to Grand Island that you started going off into the engineering side while still doing meteorology, like you said, to see how the buildings were built and how a tornado, depending on the size, the strength, and more or less the strength, can tear it down or blow it to pieces and some buildings are left unscathed or in some cases twisted like the building in Lubbock that was hit by an F5 in 1970. Exactly. I mean, there's a whole other discipline here that had my interest and so that's I expressed that. I expressed that I was interested and they said, you know, you should consider coming over to the civil engineering department and working through and getting a master's degree in, in engineering and then you'd have the best of both worlds. You'd be an engineer and a meteorologist. So at the time I said I'd consider it but obviously going back to school was something that would be a difficult decision to make for myself and my, my family as well. My mom and dad weren't too happy about me being a professional student. So I had to make a consideration and, and I think it was almost made for me because at that time uh, Jimmy Carter, the president, had put a freeze on hiring so the Weather Service and uh, government agencies were not hiring and I couldn't find a job. So my decision was made quickly that I'd go back to school and become an engineer. So, but you still had your hobby that you still wanted to go chasing when you had the time like you still do today. So well, yeah, you know, the, the engineering program there was pro chasing. In fact, they funded us the chase. They even had again, their interests were photogrammetry, so they continued to fund us and they were the, the main funding source for us. Atmo did not have money to back us up. So uh, we formed uh, we had to do this kind of formally and we had a plan that I had to write up on how to form this group, this trying to intercept group, because we really didn't have a plan before. And then I wrote a chase manual, a how-to guide. I was published in 82. But we had versions of it back then in 1980. And I think 1980 is when we decided, in the fall of 1980 and the spring of 81, is when we decided we were going to make this formal and we were going to actually be funded for it to storm chase. And so in 81 is when we really went ahead, not just from a casual interest, but we had a scientific mission uh, that we had to fulfill for funding. And, and 81, there was quite a number of tornadoes, especially in Oklahoma. There's quite a lot of video of those from research. So that would in turn be something you were connected with at the time. That's correct. Uh, we had the Warren tornadoes in April and then the uh, I believe the Binger tornadoes. We had several tornado events. We went out and surveyed. We also had high quality movie film and it was uh, really a good a good test for us to see whether or not we could track tornadoes down, film them in close range with high quality movies. I mean for us it was a challenge. I mean it was already done with the Union City storm with OU and, and their group and SSL and they did that back in 73, but we wanted to see if we could do it ourselves. Now, from what I remember about the, the seeing those videos, is there would be s sound packages and whatnot, which sounds completely odd because I don't know what that would entail, that a tornado makes a roar noise, but so I don't know what that was about, but that the you look at the, the video, and I 
I can't remember which one. It's from 1981, but you see the tornado going by, and they're all going crazy, the people in this vehicle. So it's And they're all going crazy about the lightning and whatnot, but was that how it almost was back in, the, in that, that, that time, that it was completely crazy and, like you had said earlier, you had nothing, you pretty much had to go by the seat of your pants, more or less? Well, you know, we still kind of do that away today because you get almost too much information. I mean, you, you know what a rain-free base is, you know what a wall cloud is, you know how storms sort of behave, and so all you need to do is find the right storm, get in the right spot, and of course it was difficult to do, but we did it many times, and it was done successfully. We saw many tornadoes with all the gadgetry, and so it shows that it can be done, it was done. So today, of course, it's easier in terms of getting information, knowing where the storms are. That was one of the biggest problems we had is uh, we our, our visibility is all we had. I mean, if we couldn't see 20 miles, and that's all we had. We had a head of the storm within 20 miles. Uh, it was really difficult if a storm was 100 miles away in tornadoes. We would not know about it until we got home that night. Well, today you know fairly quickly where the tornadoes are, what storms are producing tornadoes, even if they're 100 miles away. So today we get a lot more information than we did back then. So you ended up graduating, and then if I, and I'd have to go and look, because I think you graduated with at from from Texas Tech with your 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 master's degree and your degree in engineering as well. So then after that, you ended up going to where you are now. Your in, the engineering firm Hag or Hog or I'll probably it's Hag. It's Hag, and was. When you went there, was, were they looking for somebody in your position? Because I can't see that there was a lot of civil engineers that were also meteorologists. Even today, there's probably not as many. And back then, there were probably, you may have been one of very few. Well, Hague Engineering is a failure and damage consulting company, so weather-related failures play a role in their business. They weren't really too excited about my meteorology background, but the fact that I had some meteorology background was of some interest to them, uh, but it wasn't the driving interest. The driving interest was the fact that I graduated as an engineer, that I passed the engineering examination, and that I needed to go for four years in an apprenticeship program to get my PE license. And so they were looking at me as an engineer first and the meteorology sort of a distant second, but they soon found out how valuable having that meteorology degree was and because of that they wanted me to hire more engineers and meteorologists having dual degrees and I've done that so we have uh, uh, three engineers slash meteorologists with our company. And is that like where we're going now that you'd need to have with with me, the meteorology field kind of being over bloated, is having a degree in say engineering going to help you get jobs in the private sector like at in any engineering firm? Absolutely, it helps to have multiple degrees or multiple emphasis that you have. Just being a meteorologist only is not enough for many companies today. In fact, our company will not hire just a meteorologist. Maybe in the future they will, but for the most part right now and for the past 70 years, that they're not interested in meteorologists. What they're interested in are engineers and whatever fields they have interests in. So if it's meteorology, great. But engineering is first and foremost because we are an engineering firm. You have to be an engineer that is on track to get registered so that you have a PE license. That's the key. They want all engineers to eventually get a PE license and that way you know they can uh, they comply with the laws. 
it gets a minute. I got it. Okay. So, um, when you you were at your engineering firm in the eighties, you st and and this was even beforehand. You started going to hurricanes as well. Was that something you were interested in besides tornadoes? Was ha what happens with when hurricanes go through and de start destroying stuff? Sure, uh, we're interested in how wind affects buildings, and we get called in not only to do surveys, but we get called in on individual properties where there may be a question of how much wind damage there is to a building. So there certainly is an interest and has been about assessing wind damage to buildings and going to as many hurricanes as possible. So yeah, but I've already had hurricane experience because back in Texas Tech, I went through my first hurricane in 1980, which was Hurricane Allen in Corpus Christi. And so that had some merit when I was interviewing for this job uh, on, hey, I've already been in our hurricane and I've already evaluated buildings because of hurricane force winds. So they like that. I told myself when I went to interview and I, I turned the tables a little bit. You know, they were there saying, we want to see if we should hire you. And I turned it around and, 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 and said, you do need to hire me. I mean, look at what I bring to the table here. And, of course, they like that kind of a boldness move on my part, uh, in a way. that I was still a greenhorn on the thing, and, and, but I'm still bold and driven, and they like that passion, and they said, okay, we'll give you a shot. So they hired me, but I also got another job at the same time, and I had to make a decision whether I was going to do something totally different, which was go off into the broadcast and go off into radar analysis or whether I was going to work for this company, Hague Engineering. But I chose Hague because it, it's been around a long time. It's one of the oldest engineering firms around and long track record, long track record of stability. Employees who hire on with the company typically stay. So I like that. I like the fact that you could do your whole career at Hague Engineering, and that's what I started with. And gosh, here we are. 2015, I've been at the same company the whole time. Yeah, and you haven't even turned 60 yet. No, I'm close, though. I'm very close. <laughs> but, but Too close. We're, we're, we're not going to get into the age even though you're not 60. But anyway... So, when you go to do surveys, and this would include any surveys in the past, all of these torna big tornado events even in the past 10 years, when you go and do a survey, what do you look for first when you look at, at a building or an area that's been damaged by a tornado? Well, we first want to get an idea of the overall size, which is basically path width, path length and the most intense areas and, and identify them. I certainly like to do aerial surveys because from the air you can see a whole lot more in a very short period of time and take a lot of photographs and be able to pivot off of certain buildings like you know, you're up there in the air and you say, oh, I want to go there. I want to see the, that part. That's interests me. So you can sort that out quickly and so I like to do an aerial as soon as possible before doing a, a lot of detailed work on the ground. So when you've, and we'll be specific on these tornadoes for a time, of all the tornadoes that you've surveyed, what is considered the worst damage you've ever seen of your entire time? Well, to me, that you know, there's like a top five list. And I think Gerald, Texas and, uh, has got to be up there. Uh, near the top, 1997. This was a tornado that was slow moving and hit a subdivision on the north side of Gerald and killed a lot of people, although the, the number of homes destroyed weren't a whole lot, but it destroyed them completely and scoured the ground, removed pavement. It was a very intense, slow moving tornado, some of the most intense I've seen. Bridge Creek, 99 was again an extremely intense tornado and 
So it's these kinds of tornadoes that scour the ground and just lumber along big, wide tornadoes that have been the strongest that I've seen. And 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 with with Gerald, with when a tornado is moving, if I rem remember that tornado was moving maybe barely at five miles per hour, if that. I think most of the time it was stationary. It was a very slow moving tornado to the southwest, and I've done some rough calculations. And if you went through the center of that tornado, uh, it would be over your house for almost three minutes. And when you have a tornado that does that, is the damage, of course, is going to be that there's nothing left. But compare that to, say, a tornado moving at 55 miles per hour, and it does the same type of damage. Is that what becomes more interesting, that how a tornado that moves or doesn't move compared to one that's moving very quickly, and the damage is almost the same? Well, of course, from the rating standpoint, uh, the ratings don't really account for the duration factor. The Gerald Tornado, it's been argued, had actually lower winds, and it just lasted longer. And that's why it looked like it was a 5. But some argue it was actually a 3. And that, that's fine. I understand the duration factors involved with that. And as a tornado moves faster and faster, it's rotational speed is added to its translation, so it packs a lot of punch on that right side if it's moving northeast. And and so, you know, it's going to have a lot more punch there. So it can be argued either way, but duration is a factor. It's not something we use in the EF scale today or even in the old F scale. It's gone. It gets rated appropriately regardless of duration. So... Now we go back to, say, hurricanes. When you've gone through a lot of hurricanes, and you've been through quite a number of them, what would be considered the worst hurricane damage that you saw with regards to, to hurricanes? Well, certainly Andrew and Hugo are some of my all-time favorites. Uh, those are for winds. For, for storm surge, Katrina and Ivan were phenomenal uh, storm surge hurricanes, generations. So uh, my favorites would be Andrew and Hugo for wind and Katrina and Ivan for storm surge. So when you look at damage caused by a hurricane, it's not the same as a tornado, of course, unless a storm gets hit by a tornado in a spiral band. But when you well, look at damage from... A, hurricanes, what do you look for in that case? Is it storm surge or the wind and how it was blown around? When, For example, and I'm blabbing again, if you're well, say, on the north side and you have a strong east wind, then the eye passes overhead and then you have a strong west wind, is that where you kind of look as to how the building kind of swayed or kind of went one wet way and then when the backside came, it then completely blew it away because it had been weakened? Sure. I mean, we look at trajectories. We look at where did the roofing go, which way did it go, uh, if the roof structure, people have insulation in their attics, and if you rip open the roof structure, you will have the attic insulation go aloft, and it, there's typically trees around, so you'll see which ones have the wet insulation stuck on them, like flocking, the Christmas tree, it's similar. So we can tell when in the life cycle of this hurricane did the roof damage occur or the roof structure get destroyed and in the same token we look at the water heights and where they are with respect to what elevations the houses are at and we also look at the tide gauge information to determine how high the water got when so there's a wind versus water that, well, that's what we do a lot of on the coast. And then there's just inland, away from that. Then there's just strictly wind at higher elevations. And we look and, and determine how much damage there was, what the level of the winds were. Are there any building code violations? Did it meet code? A lot of questions are, are asked, from, uh, especially insurance points of view and legal points of view. So when we 
talk about a hurricane and it hits some place, let's say X, wherever X is. When you look at that, you have to look at the building codes and are in some cases when a hurricane comes through, do you or does the engineering firm have to go in and say that these codes have to be fixed because say some stuff may be right but some stuff may not be? Well, there's been an, uh, certainly a tremendous push to improve building codes. The state of Florida has done a remarkable job at improving their building codes since well, back before all this happened and with Katrina and uh, even the hurricanes of that Florida got hit in 04, there, the building codes have been steadily improving. And I like the way they're going. I like the fact that they have wind-borne debris areas now that require that you have impact-resistant windows or shutters put on your house, that you are required to have your roof tiles anchored down, that you are required to have your roof structure anchored down. And this is all for new construction, of course. Uh, this is not for all those older houses that are sort of grandfathered in, but they're exempt from those requirements. But one day, they'll all get replaced. So I like the move, the way the building codes are. They've been slower in other parts of the coast to improve them. But Florida has done the remarkable job, and Florida sticks out, so it's at most risk. So then when we go to building codes for hurricanes, what about building codes in tornado-prone areas, say Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, and even, say, in Dixie Alley, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Tennessee, a tornado hits someplace, are building codes going to have to be changed, or have they been changed with regards to tornadoes? And if not, can they even be changed, depending on, for example, like mobile homes? A mobile home is not going to... You can build the best mobile home ever, but if it's not... A, a, even a weak tornado can throw it somewhere. Well, that's... a. Uh... Great questions you asked there because uh, Moore, Oklahoma, which you know has been hit by many tornadoes, they, even before this latest event, had uh, earlier in the year had increased their building code from the normal 90 mile per hour three second gust that, of old to 135 miles an hour. And they're the only community in the country that has increased their building code for tornadoes. Tornadoes are normally exempted out of the building codes because of their rarity. And the odds of getting hit with a tornado are pretty rare. But, of course, folks and more don't believe that they're that rare. And it was interesting that the city of Moore took that initiative, and hopefully other municipalities will. But it, it puts a lot of burden on builders because builders in the center part of the U.S. are not used to putting in straps in homes and tying them all down and together or put solid sheathing around homes. It increases the cost a little bit, but I like the fact that the uh, building quality can be improved. I think it can be overall, uh, but it's going to take a lot longer to do that given the feeling people have about tornadoes and how rare they are. So Given the fact, it, say, even for the fact with hurricanes, they seem to be so rare, it, it may be a cycle that we're going back into a, a period of fewer hurricanes, but like tornadoes and, and like hurricanes, they can go wherever. I mean, you could have Sandy up in New York City, and then you could have like an Ivan in Texas, and then a Katrina in Louisiana, and you could have something blowing across the Carolina Outer Banks similar to, say, like a tornado hitting more for the 50th time in the last five years or whatever. I mean, this is where the building codes, I mean, you have to change them, but change them for something that may happen in five minutes or five years, I mean, that's, that could be the case also with hurricanes. Well, hurricanes, you know, we live in a short lifespan, the hurricanes have been smacking the United States and tornadoes have been roaming the plains for 
tens and thousands and hundreds of thousands of years. So we come along, we put up buildings, we get in harm's way, and you know we we have to learn to live with these things. They're not going to get rid of. In fact, we're going to be more susceptible to getting hit with them in the future. So we have to build better and be able to have our preparedness efforts improved and be able to have our recovery efforts improved after the disaster. Because there will be disasters. This, that's my business. My business has been booming because of the dis disasters that keep occurring now. But they may seem infrequent, but actually there's obviously tornadoes that occur every year and there's obviously hurricanes that occur every year. And whether they hit anything, that's yeah. another story. But uh, we, we, we see them and they fluctuate. I mean, some years you only get uh, 800 tornadoes. Some years you'll get 1,500 tornadoes. But they fluctuate about a mean. So we, we can expect certainly an average of about 1,200 tornadoes a year. Uh, we can expect an average of uh, three, four, five hurricanes a year. Uh, you know, there can be years much higher and years very few. So there's about when we talk about rarities, when we're talking about tornadoes and, and, and hurricanes, Oklahoma has lately been having a lot of earthquakes. And now that leads us to the thing of our building codes going to have to be changed in Oklahoma. And even with the new Madrid fault over in Memphis up the Mississippi River, where they're doing some work on engineering for a possible big earthquake, now there's these somewhat moderate ones in Oklahoma. So our engineering firms and house builders and building people building buildings having to think about earthquakes and tornadoes in places like Oklahoma. Well, when it comes to the earthquakes, if you're at a, a less than 4.0 uh, on an earthquake, it, it's typic it can make the ground rumble and you can feel it, but the response of buildings, uh, just the way they're constructed, uh, normally has, uh, has no problem handling that. Uh, humans are much more sensitive to such vibrations than a building is. Uh, buildings can move around, but they, they take it without, without any harm, uh, usually. I mean, it's not saying all, all the time. So th as far as those are concerned, not a big deal. Now, you mentioned the New Madrid Fault, though, however. Now, that's a, that's a much bigger deal. That's, that's not typically 2 or 3.0. Those uh, earthquakes are higher but they occur much more with rarity in them. But communities all the way, like even St. Louis, uh, have got to be concerned about that because, for the most part, those codes up there have not considered earthquakes, especially in something in the 7 or 8.0 range, as being something that they designed for. And everybody thinks about earthquakes as being a West Coast problem, but there's been plenty of earthquakes that have occurred in the New Madrid uh, zone and there's been a few that have been extremely uh, high and uh, that's where they need to rethink about building in that area and how to improve those codes. But it's slow coming. They get a lot of resistance for that because it adds to cost. So, well I didn't want to go off on earthquakes but it did just happened to be that Oklahoma is getting a lot of them it seems of late mm -hmm. but um, now we'll go back to tornadoes and storm chasing because you've been doing it since like dirt was created or at least since video was uh, becoming a real big thing when you compare to when you were still doing the research projects in the 80s compared to now is have you run into the problem of the traffic jams, the convergences of chasers nowadays compared to 30 years ago when you couldn't see uh, anybody for like one, two, three, four plus miles. Oh, then back in the late 70s, you could have a storm to yourself. Um, these days, it can be quite crazy and hectic, especially in Oklahoma and parts of Texas in Kansas where their roads are jammed full of people and it's certainly uh, taken away from the, the beauty of the storm in my book because it's dangerous. People are 
jamming up highways and you know, yeah, I'm one of these chasers that's been doing it a long time. But if you look at who's out there, it's a, it's a tremendous variation of people who are out there. I mean, you have a lot of locals that are out there. Instead of seeking shelter, they're getting in their trucks and getting out there to witness the storm and their, and their kids and their dogs. And it's turned into be a more socially acceptable thing, much to the dismay of law enforcement. Uh, they see tremendous numbers of people now, and it turns into literally crowds and how to deal with crowds when you have a storm that's moving and you don't know what direction the storm is moving. And if it produces a tornado or a large hail, then you've got hazards there. So, because, and most people would think the movie Twister was probably the reason that started this ordeal. Because when Twister came out, which was, oh my gosh, 19 years ago this month, it came out in April of 96, that seems to be when it blossomed. Could, can you actually tell that that's when it actually took off and became dangerous, was right after Twister came out in 96? Well, certainly it was one of what I would think several catalysts were to go ahead and stimulate people's desire to get out and see something like that. I mean, we have the uh, local media as well having their storm trackers out there. And uh, how many times do you hear, you know, uh, if you see something good, send it in. And we'll put it on the air and mention your name. Uh, so that drives the process as well. It's not just Twister, but Twister certainly was part of it uh, to doing that. So, and we discussed this before we went on about local media, and do they tend to, because you're in Dallas, and Dallas tends to not be much of a severe weather market, comparatively speaking to, say, Oklahoma City, where the minute there's a blip on a radar, everybody's on the air going crazy, and they have 500 storm trackers running around clogging roads with other storm chasers that are from who knows where, with 500 video feeds, now compare, because you've been in, in both places, in fact, even in Kansas, and you talked about it earlier, is the difference between where you are now, where you're in the suburbs of Dallas-Fort Worth, compared to Oklahoma City where you've chased, in fact, just as recently as a week ago on Wednesday, is that also the problem, too, with the media, like you'd said earlier, hyping everything and making everybody say, send us stuff, we'll put you on the air, and you'll see your name, and you get big egos. Well, of, of course, that adds to it. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people and that want to get their name on TV, that want to see their video on TV. They'll give it for free. They won't, you know, just to get their name on TV. So there's a lot of people out there doing that. You see how, how many times you see on the news uh, cell phone video. You know, they're not out there taking high-quality HD movies on tripods or whatever. They're, they're, they'll just film it from their cell phone. So the quality is not too much of an issue. It's what, what did you film or what did you take? That's the issue. And, you know, they don't, media doesn't want to pay anything for it these days. So it's, uh, it's a free market out there. Now, when you chased, well, let's make it sound like you don't. Uh, when you were chasing back in the day, when you would send video in, you didn't do it for money for, for more or less a reason. You did it because you wanted to see the storms, and you wanted to see it and see what it does and whatnot. And you still do that now, I assume. But is it more about a case where chasers are doing it to get money that they know is probably not coming? Well, my, my goal, if I film something great, is going to be to get some money for it. I mean, that's the way it always has been. I have an expensive hobby here. I drive 10,000 plus miles every year. I take a month and a half off work, so with no pay. Uh, so I have a lot here. I spend a lot of money, fuel and, and food and hotels. So yes, I, if I get something good, I want to sell it to uh, the TV stations. That has been in, in the past. Now in the last three or four years, since there are so many people who do that, it no longer becomes 
uh, viable to do that anymore. Uh, my sales on videos have gone down uh, dramatically in the last three or four years, and so uh, I'm no longer interested in selling my, my video unless I, the, the right person comes along. I do have a standing agreement with NBC, so uh, they have the right of first refusal. If, uh, if I get something good, they, they'll look at it and, and buy it or not. So uh, that's fine, but it's not the reason I do this. I mean, I obviously go out and chase because I've always loved to do this, and it wasn't until probably the early 90s when the improvements on video uh, came out with high 8 back then that I started seriously considering selling and paying for this expensive hobby. But before that, it was strictly my love and passion, and it's going to end up being that way. So I'll, I'll come full circle with that. And uh, just going out and, and seeing a storm uh, doesn't have to produce tornado, but a, a pretty sunset, a nice rainbow, a nice looking storm. Uh, and that's all, that's all that pleases me. I like that uh, very much, and I like to see uh, this every year. So I have in my hand, which I don't have my video up, a VHS tape. This was this was a, a couple of videos that were made, I believe it was by Tom Grizzulis, and this one happens to feature you quite often. In fact, this one has almost it was almost like a biography of you almost. And this is how I knew about you because I was like, oh, ooh, this guy, he gets all excited about tornadoes and he freaks out every five minutes that there's a tornado and he goes crazy. <laughs> it's like are you still kind of like that, or is it because this was 20 years ago that you calmed down? Well, you know, there's different levels of freaking out. I think some people have exceeded uh, my my freaking out uh, level uh, today, I and mean, there's certainly a number of chasers that that, to me, anyways, go go beyond my excitement level. Uh, yeah, I get excited about it because it's rare if you. Chase as long as I chase, you pay a lot of dues, you burn out, you bust out a lot of a lot of things. So when you see something very majestic that nature has to offer, I think it's certainly can get excited about that, and I've I've definitely shared that with people by videoing that, and hopefully they get that sense of excitement out of it, and I've done that with BHS and and then with uh, DVDs. So when when you've done it, because you've not chased by yourself most of the time, you've been with other chasers. Is that kind of like the way you go? Is you sometimes go by yourself, but most of the time you go with other people? That's true. I do that for a couple of reasons. First of all, storm chasing to me is a social event, sort of the the, the night out with with the guys and, and gals, and it's a night out. It's fun and I like to meet people, uh, have a great dining experience, uh, meet people on the side of the road, share stories, and tell fishermen stories, you know, as old chasers do. So it's a social experience. I like that. I think it's part of it. But there's also a safety aspect. I go with Carson Eads and used to chase with Gene Roden and, and Phil Sherman and my, my wife as well, it's just, just because it's safer. It's safer to go with more than one person. I have chased by myself, but it's it's rare and becoming more rare because my eyesight is, is failing and I don't have the night vision uh, or the stamina to drive long hours. So it's really important that I team up with someone. So when, because I know Gene and Carson were on this video, and the funny okay. thing was, at the end of this one video, they were looking at the 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 chase vehicle, and and I saw this video just recently. Again, I've watched it several times, and I have to start laughing because I think it was you, because it sounds like it was you. You were like, "We can get the Weather Channel live." I'm thinking, "Yeah," and it's like, "Who wants the Weather Channel now?" <laughs> they hardly talk about weather. Well, you know, years ago the Weather Channel did have weather. I mean, let's face it; that the, there are weather coverage has certainly gone downhill since then. 
So when you talk about back in, was like the heyday, would, you would literally say the heyday was like the 90s, especially the mid-90s, say 95, 96, around that time well, frame, and even before that in the early 90s? Well, certainly. And the 90s were, were the golden years for me. Uh, 91 was the first year I had a high 8 camera. I saw 31 tornadoes there. I filmed many of them with some uh, really good quality video in those days, and I have some great images from the, from the 90s. Uh, in 2000, I've seen many, many great tornadoes in the 2000 to 2010 decade, and it's the video quality has improved dramatically with the HD that has come out, and now you can get HD cameras fairly inexpensively. So I, I think that the technology has... I've seen tremendous changes and advancements in just the video quality since the 90s. I mean, before then, it was a portable VHS, and it was uh, very poor quality. And even before then, it was the 8-millimeter cartridges I used to carry around with me that would only last about three minutes, and all grainy and not very good quality. So I'm really happy with the way the technology has improved with the video today. Now, was there any storm chases back in the day and even maybe even closer to present day that you got in some bad situations? Well, once in a while, I mean, you're going to get in a bad situation. And hopefully you have an escape route that you can get out of there. That happens with chasing tornadoes or hurricanes. I've had, I've had examples on both where you've been in bad situations. I mean, El Reno to me was a bad situation. I had kept my distance, but that distance was cut shorter than I wanted to, uh, and, and certainly cut in to my uh, factor of safety, if you will, uh, on that day. So I had, I've had closer calls than I wanted to, uh, but I've fortunately been able to make the calms, keep calm, make correct decisions, and, and get out of the harm's way. Now, I'm I'm looking through your this article because you were also involved with the Vortex Two project. I'm not sure you were involved with the the first Vortex project, although you were seemingly around the Vortex project, the first one, because this video, the DHS, has you seemingly around a lot of Vortex people. So, how did you get involved with the Vortex Two project? Well, first I'll just. Uh kind of a couple of questions there. With Vortex 1, yes, I uh, was, I had their frequency on the radio, so I knew uh, what they were doing and where they were going. Also, Eric Rasmussen headed that. I used to chase with Eric back in uh, Texas Tech days, so uh, you know, I, I, had, I had some inside knowledge of, of who was speaking and what they were thinking. Uh, with Vortex 2, uh, it was a great opportunity to be in, in the pod deployment program, and that's what I would dream of. And Dr. Josh Worman of CSWR, the Center for Weather Research, asked me if I would be involved with the program, and they had a lot of students there that had never chased or had very limited chasing, and they wanted someone with a little senior status there to go in at close range and deploy pods and get out of there. And so he, he selected me and I was really tickled about the whole thing and I had two great years with him and then he invited me back again on Rotate and work with him again. So uh, i would do it again in a heartbeat. It has to be the one that you know you, you live for. So when we talk about that and you talked about El Reno where Tim Samaras was unfortunately killed did you ever get to work with him or around him? Because I assume you knew him because all chasers pretty much know everybody. Well, I've known Tim uh, since his chaser con uh, sort of began. I mean, it started in his house, but I didn't go to that initially. I waited till they had it in a hotel, and I think that was like 02 or 03 that they started having it in hotels. Uh, but I've seen him out there chasing, and so we knew each other. 
certainly I, I remember I had Storm Track magazine, so he knew about that as well. And Tim was, of course, great as a person to talk to uh, just about chase stories. Uh, for a little while, I had worked with Silver Lining Tours, and I remember one morning where we came out uh, and saw Tim uh, and, and Carl, and the group said, oh, wow, you know, can we go over there? And I said, well, let me ask him first to see if he be okay, because it's a chase day, you know, and everybody wants to get focused on chasing. But we had some time before storms fired, and I went over there and I asked Tim, I said, Tim, would you know, you mind talking to these folks about your your probes here? And he said, no, I'll bring them over. So I, I brought them over, and he spent like a half an hour going through uh, his probes and telling tornado stories, and they just loved it. So that's just the type of person he was. He was uh, a, a person who would take time out of a busy schedule to talk tornadoes with people that he didn't know. So was it kind of really sad occasion when you found out that he had died? Well, I was obviously in shock. Still I am. I'm still in shock by the whole thing. Uh, I actually, un unbeknownst to myself, uh, examined that vehicle in detail the very next morning. I went out there, and the sheriff was with me at the time, and he said three people were killed in this vehicle, and I did not recognize it as Tim's vehicle because I thought he was in a truck. I did not know he was in such a vehicle. So, uh, But I went into the vehicle. I looked through the glove compartment to find out what type of vehicle it was, and it was really mangled up, this vehicle. And only later did I find out that it was Tim's uh, vehicle. And that was uh, really uh, and very impactful to me. So that that's kind of a bit creepy. There. Yeah. I mean, you is that kind of where it hit home that you inspect a vehicle of somebody that you know, unlike any other survey you've ever done, where it's like somebody else. This is somebody you knew, so. Is there like where the personal part kind of, it's kind of like really hard? Sure. I mean, when, when you sit in the, in the seat of a good friend uh, who has died uh, just a few hours prior, I mean, it, it's uh, really uh, sobering, bring it home, you know. It's one thing to be told that three people were killed in a vehicle, but it's another thing to, to actually know those people. So when when we you look at, the current state of chasing today, is it all about egos and all these chaser convergences and do you see the the where we could see more chasers getting killed if say a tornado, let's for example say El Reno happens again. It, it might happen, it could happen tomorrow, it could happen in a year. But what if it just turns and it just plows through a chaser convergence and kills 10, 20 people? Is that possibly the future we could be seeing? Well, certainly there's that risk out there that somebody's going to be injured or killed by either a tornado or a hail event or lightning uh, because there are so many targets now out there. So, yeah, I would say that the risk is increasing each year and that one of these days there's going to be a highway lined with people and something bad's going to happen. And, and I saw something where you're be getting involved with some how to build a building uh, to withstand at least some tornadoes, maybe not the big ones, something. Am I thinking that right or not? No, um, certainly what we want to do is think about building better, most tornadoes are weak. They're EF0, EF1. And those are 100, 120 mile an hour wind events. They certainly can build houses to resist that. They don't need to fall down at that speed. They don't need to shift off their foundation at that speed. And that's what I've always advocated. I've always advocated to build better houses to make them withstand higher winds. And certainly the EF4s and EF5 tornadoes, when you're talking about 200-mile-an-hour winds, yeah, they're going to destroy and level houses 
uh, whether or not you have clips on them or not. But those are extremely rare tornadoes. And that's what it has to be put in perspective. Your risk of getting hit by an EF4, EF5 is extremely rare. And it's just, you know, the more, if you're going to get hit with a tornado, it's going to be weak. That's going to be what the probability show. So uh, I'll ask this. You've seen a bunch of tornadoes, but have you ever been in one? I have been in some circulations that have started as just mesocyclone circulations and then became tornadoes. So, But I, I cannot claim to fame that I've ever been inside a tornado. And, and I don't think you want to be in one. No, uh, that's not my claim to fame. I'm not, and if I was, it, <clears throat> I'd feel really stupid. So when you see these people, who will remain, remain nameless, that are wanting to go into tornadoes, actually into them, what is the purpose of that then, do you, do you think? I don't know. Maybe they uh, have a suicide mission. It certainly is not healthy. So when when you see, and, I, and I'll go on to this, when you see media deciding to partner with these people that have these vehicles that want to go inside of them, does do you see where the media is kind of urging and making others want to have them so they can be on TV? Is that, is that where it's going now, that we're well, going to be sending people into tornadoes instead of just to look at them? Well, there are media-sponsored chasers. I mean, that's out there. It's been out there for quite some time. So they just better have enough liability insurance and lawyers geared up because, you know, one of these days uh, it could be a media person or a media uh, worker, somebody who works for the media, that, uh, that could be in trouble. So, and, and it's not just the tornado. I mean, if they get in a car accident, what happens if you're a storm chaser and you work for a certain TV station and you get in a car accident and, and you kill somebody uh, or you yourself get injured? I mean, somebody's going to be, be looking for the TV station uh, for some uh, restitution on that. So, I think that it's, it's something that they have got to consider about what the risks are to them. So, and you mentioned this earlier about Silver Lining Tours. I believe that's Roger's group. Am I correct? Yes, Roger now owns Holy uh, Silver Lining Tours. Okay. So how did you get connected with Roger Hill? Well, Roger Hill, again, a fellow storm chaser, great friend of mine, and like Tim Samaras, seen him out there many times, we chat at uh, a Denny's restaurant at midnight uh, when he brings in his crew in and we sit and chat a while or in the morning we try to, oh, we stay at the same hotel sometimes and, and, and talk about what we want to do for the day and then of course ChaserCon. So uh, Roger has been a, a great friend of mine over the years and uh, I've just, you know, thought I was approached about going ahead and and doing some tours and I thought well that's interesting especially in areas that I've never chased before I really haven't gone up into the Dakotas or Minnesota or, or even much in Iowa I've, I've done some Iowa chasing but not very much and I've done some Nebraska chasing but not very much because most of my chasing is south of I-70 in yeah. Kansas uh, it's, it's just too far for me to go it's, it's a long haul I mean I did tonight I, I, I looked at how long is it if I were to drive from my house to Rapid City, South Dakota, and it would be 16 and a half hours, it's actually shorter to drive to Chicago or Minneapolis. It's hard to believe I could drive to any place in Iowa in less time than it takes to get to South Dakota. So it's it's certainly difficult for me to to get up there myself. So yeah, when I was given the opportunity to to join up with Silver Lining Tours and take groups up there. Uh, I loved it. It was fantastic. A whole new uh, range to explore. So you, I'd have to ask, because there, we've had storm chasers on before, and they say Iowa is horrible, that nothing happens in Iowa, that tornadoes do not happen in our state, and, and, and whatnot. Because in hindsight, we typically have when, in Iowa that our tornadoes are typically rain-wrapped, like they are in the south. In, in especially Dixie Alley, 
or they're they're dust filled and you can't see them very well, or they're at night. Well, I'm trying to agree with up that somewhat. Right but uh, six tornadoes that I saw uh, up near Webb, Iowa. When was that? 2000... 2004. In four. 2004, okay. June 11, 2004. Uh, two supercells. The first one produces three beautiful big tornadoes, and the second one produces three smaller, but every bit of uh, phenomenal looking tornadoes uh, near Fort Dodge. So, yeah, I saw six tornadoes from two supercells in Iowa, and I will say that they are very picturesque and were not rain wrapped. So, uh, it just you have to go ahead and chase a lot and just your odds of seeing something good improve. So when when you look at it to get uh, all, all together, what do you think your legacy is going to be in the storm chasing field? I'm just another storm chaser. You know, I don't I plan to stand out very much. There's a lot uh, of people out there doing ch storm chasing. They'll go farther than I will. They, I'm certainly not the longest uh, uh, chaser who was ever chased. I mean, that would be David Hoadley, and I think his legacy is going to stand for a very long time. Uh, as far as uh, beautiful tornadoes and, and, and great footage, there's been a tremendous number of chasers that have that. So, you know, I've, I just wanted to enjoy this guy. Yes, I was earlier than most chasers uh, to start on that. And it's just because I think we all share the same passion when we go out and storm chase to see the beauty of the sky. We're not just out there to look at tornadoes. We're out there just to see the beauty of the sky. And there apparently are thousands of people that have that same passion. And so that's great. I just... Uh, Hope that they're safe. I don't want to see anybody get killed or injured anymore. So let's uh, just be safe out there. So when I'll get it. So what do other storm chasers think of you being kind of the se one of the senior members of storm chasing? No, I knew you were going to use the word senior one of these days. Yes, I'm a senior citizen, uh, and I've done it for uh, since 1976 is when I. First started going out. Uh, I didn't come to Texas until '78, uh, so I've been doing it uh, for not quite, but getting almost to the 4-0 mark on chasing. Uh, so I've done it a long time, and I just say, you know, I've been able to survive. You can't see hundreds of tornadoes and, and go through dozens of hurricanes and survive unless you you try to be safe. And I think that's what I'm going to. Uh, put forth if, uh, to my final breath is to be safe out there. So what what do you think of storm chasers, most of the decent ones today? Do you have some respect for them and not respect for others? Well, I think when they get their video and they post their video and they start getting criticisms for getting too close and criticisms for doing this or that, they need to kind of sit back and think, wow, were they really safe at doing what they did? And what is going to be their excuse? They, they think that people will enjoy their video. That's why they, they do this and they post it. But not everybody enjoys their video. Some uh, would say that uh, some of these videos show how stupid they are and show how how careless or reckless they are, and that they set a poor example. You have to think about all sides of that. Next time you think about posting a video, you have to think about, well, how are other people going to view this? You know, would, how's my mom going to view this? You know, <laughs> or how's the sheriff going to view this? Uh, you have to think about all the different kinds of people that are going to see your video, and then, you know, if if you think you can defend it successfully, fine. But if not, uh, you, you may not want to post that video. So I would say uh, just think about the next time you're going to be posting a video short and sassy about it, uh, about this to uh, see who your audience is. You have kids watching this, so watch your, watch your mouth. And it's just uh, trying to be on, on the best behavior and to show folks that you are a responsible person out there. 
so I. I've, I I want to get through some of this other stuff before we get done because I know it's now dark and you're getting tired. Because yeah, and I, I think we need to wrap it up here in the next five or so. That yeah. So you've been on several TV shows. You've been on NPR. You've had magazines. You had Storm Track, as you said. So what was it like to be kind of like on TV and doing all this stuff? Well, t TV is no big deal. I've, I've been on many programs. It's all about the soundbite, uh, which is not too exciting. There are very few TV programs that I would even rank with education in, in the same sentence. Uh, most of it is just ooh-ah uh, kind of stuff. Uh, I've certainly been doing less and less of that over the years because, after all, as you pointed out, I am senior, and I'm outside the uh, zone of people who watch these programs in terms of my age, so uh, fewer and fewer requests to do so. And, of course, there are more uh, uh, brazen chasers, if you will, out there, younger and uh, vibrant, and much more uh, daring than I ever was. So you were also on the quick response team when you were doing tornado surveys, and I know that that doesn't exist anymore, I think. So talk about the QRT and, and how you got onto that and some of the tornado places you've gone with the QRT. I think Gerald was one of them that you mentioned earlier. Well, the, the quick response team was uh, a, a short attempt to get people in the know out there after a disaster, as soon as possible, to decide what the F and or EF scale was, this came about um, from the Plata, Maryland tornado in 2002. That I was on the NOAA survey team then, but it wasn't called a quick response team until later. For the most part, the quick response team is still there, but it's been absorbed into the weather service because there's been a lot of training done on the EF scale. You can go online right now and. and learn modules on how to rate buildings and learn about the EF scale. There's an EF scale kits out there that you can download or look at. I think it's it's great to have all this knowledge out there. So yeah, at one time there was a need for it and now it's just absorbed within the uh, weather service itself. So yeah, that'll end our, our questioning. So we We'll do shout outs now, so you have to shout out anything, a person, storm chasers, media people you don't like or whatever. And I'm I'm gonna shout out the, the videos that Tom Grazulis did that Tim Marshall is featured in quite often and a lot of his video and you can see him getting excited. Back when he was vibrant, but not as brazen as some some chasers were back in the day. So that's gonna be my shout out. So Tim, you can shout out whoever you want. Storm chasers, media, whatever. No, I'm, I'm, I don't need to shout out. I think everybody knows who uh, they are. And, of course, with our social media like Facebook and, and Twitter, uh, they get to hear reactions pretty quickly about uh, whether people like them or, or don't like them. So I, I think the public's a great judge of how people, our chasers, uh, behave. And they better be careful because, you know, we, how many times we watch uh, uh, videos that, or see videos where somebody says, you know, watch me break into this store or watch me speed or something, and then the police use that video against them. It's like, uh, you know, be, be cautious of what you do and put, and put out there because it can and will be used against you. So just be careful about that. Oh, I assume you haven't done that. Well, I have not. I, I certainly have not posted anything that I thought was uh, going to get me into trouble. And fortunately, you know, I've got plenty of videos out there, uh, and I haven't had any any video trouble, and nothing that has been come back to haunt me. So, how can people get a hold of you? I know you're on Facebook, and I know your email. So, tell them, tell the audience what they are, so they can get a hold of you. Well, go ahead and, and uh, friend me on Facebook or send me a message on Facebook. That's the best way to get a hold of me. Except I didn't do that. I actually emailed him. 
that's fine. But I don't want my emails to be out there publicly, and uh, you know, true. They are they are anyways. If you want to find me, you can find me. There's there's not a problem with that. Uh, you, my emails are plastered all over the internet. And and if anybody wants to be uh, to see him in person, he's going to be in I think South Padre Island. Is it next week? Yes, uh, that is a closed uh, group, though. That is a yeah. Uh, for, invite only media only uh, but in the spring I'm frequently asked to appear in various uh, National Weather Service uh, either uh, type events or AMS chapters or NWA chapters of events so uh, I'm out there in the springtime and you know just Facebook I'll, I post all this stuff on my Facebook page where I'll be when and you can come and see me yeah, because he says he'll be down there and a tornado outbreak will happen. So, <laughs> oh, and it will next Thursday. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely next Thursday. Uh, you know, I'm totally committed, and I I do this, and the odds are that one of these days. Of course, it's been happening several years in a row. But uh, when I'm away, the tornadoes just have fun. Yeah, it, it's when you're away, the tornadoes will play. That's right. So. We thank you for taking your time that you could have been okay. spending trying to sleep and whatnot for being well, on. I'm sleeping computer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll close out the show while you can depart to your to your sleeping time. So. Oh. Alrighty. Take care. Okay. Bye, Tim. Bye. Bye. So that was Tim Marshall, who was on our program. We are gracious that he was on with us. So next week. We'll be talking historical weather. Tom Coombs from WBND in South Bend, Indiana, will be on, on the program talking about Palm Sunday, 1965. Dave Nussbaum from WWL in New Orleans will be on on Friday, April 17th. Fred Gossage from WBRC in Birmingham on Thursday. That's a Thursday show, April 23rd. Eric Wilhelm from WFMJ in Youngstown, Ohio. We'll be discussing the Ohio and Pennsylvania tornado outbreak in 1985 that occurred at the end of May. John Wetter from the Hop WRF is going to be back on on Friday, May 8th. We're going to be discussing the 50th anniversary of the Twin Cities tornado outbreak that occurred only a month after the Palm Sunday outbreak. Jeff Baskin will be on from KLRT in Little Rock, Arkansas to talk about weather down there. And from there on, we have some open spaces after that as we move toward the end of May and into June. So this is uh, Polygon, issuance number 53. We do this every Friday night, or we try to, unless we have a show on Thursday or Saturday or whatever. So you can get a hold of me on Twitter at IowaWX. That's I-O-W-A-W-X. You can find the Iowa Weather Network, where I do a lot of my posting, at IAWX.net. You can find uh, our other people on there as well that are there. And you can email me at iowawx, that's I-O-W-A-W-X, at gmail.com. So for that and for Tim, who's on with us, we thank everybody for watching and hopefully have a good weekend and have a safe Easter and God bless.